let's uh, continue our service, um, which today John Langridge is preaching to us, and Sarah Edwards, who's our church administrator, is going to give us a testimony. Um, but now we're going to move into a time of prayer, and the time of prayer will conclude with that lovely chorus, Be Still, for the presence of the Lord, which we will um, use as a prayer. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, meet with us here this morning. Guide our words and thoughts. Anoint John as he speaks to us and Sarah as she shares words of testimony. We pray that we will grow, grow closer to you today. And now be still, for the presence of the Lord is moving in our hearts. And now some words of confession. Dear Heavenly Father, we lower our heads before you and we confess that we have too often forgotten that we are yours. Sometimes we carry on our lives as if there were no God and we fall short of being credible witnesses to you. For these things we ask your forgiveness and we also ask for your strength. Give us clear minds and open hearts so we may witness to you in our world. Remind us to be who you would have us to be, regardless of what we are doing or who we are with. Hold us to you and build our relationship with you and with those you have given us on earth. and the collect for the day. O oh God, the protector of all who trust in you, without whom nothing is strong, nothing is holy, increase and multiply upon us your mercy, 
that with you as our ruler and guide, we may so pass through things temporal that we lose not our hold on things eternal. Grant this, Heavenly Father, for our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen. And now we're going to move on to our reading, followed by the sermon. And at the end of the sermon, we're going to have a song of response. Make me a channel of your peace. But we'll start with our reading, which Stu and Sue Horobin are going to bring us. And it's from Acts 8, verses 26 to 40. Today's, Today's reading, reading is taken from Acts at chapter 8, verses 26 to 40. Philip and the Ethiopian. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandaki, which means Queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah, the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah, the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I? Unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, please, who was the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they travelled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptised? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptised him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away. And the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and travelled about, preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Should say that another way god is active he's at work i don't know if you realize it but all the time he's constantly working away building the kingdom you may not have been aware of it because it's happening quietly imperceptibly almost no crash bang wallop demonstrations of power just quiet infiltration jesus said it would be like that he said the kingdom of heaven is, is like a grain of mustard seed growing into a great tree. Or it's like a, a tiny bit of yeast causing a large lump of dough to expand and grow. Quietly, silently, the kingdom grows. Not through the nows of canny businessmen or clever PR or even by computers or automation. But by ordinary people doing small and seemingly insignificant things. 
the followers of Jesus. Uh, that's you and me, by the way, people of faith. Now, if it was up to me and I was trying to build a kingdom, I wouldn't particularly choose people like me for an important task like that. Um, but that's the plan God has. And it does seem to work. After all, he started with 12 very unlikely Jesus followers when Jesus ascended into heaven. And look how far it's come. Millions, billions of followers now. It's grown by infection. Christians passing on the good news, gossiping the gospel to their friends and family and neighbours. It's a bit like the spread of a virus, and we all know about that now. We're all familiar with the R number, you know, how many people you've infected today. And uh, the virus of the good news spreads the same way. The R number for the Christians spreading the good news virus in, in, early, uh, in the early church must have been huge. And the, and, and the kingdom spreads in the same way even today. Over the past weeks, we've been learning how God has made us creative. We're made in his image and he's creative, so he's made us creative. And how he's placed in each of us special gifts and abilities and now we begin to see why he's equipped us because he's depending on us to get the kingdom building job done well in this part of the kingdom anyway this little bit here in Baston Hill and, and, and you would say oh well okay um, but how, how does this work how should I what should I do what does he want me to do to help build this kingdom and that's where the guiding spirit of today's title comes in. The Holy Spirit takes the raw material placed in us by God and makes it effective in helping to establish and grow the kingdom. Sometimes people describe the, the Holy Spirit as a source of power and they use the illustration of a car which doesn't go anywhere until you put some petrol in the tank. I really don't like that picture. It turns the Holy Spirit into a gallon of four star unleaded. Oh, horrible. I like the picture of the Spirit breathing life into us and nurturing us. Just like taking a dry, inanimate seed and planting and watering it, releasing all the amazing potential within to bring into being our wonderful, fruitful plant. Well, to see how this works, how the spirit guides and releases God's kingdom building potential in us. Let's look at Philip in our, our reading. Philip was holding revival meetings in a city in Samaria with great success. People were turning to Jesus in droves. But suddenly he was taken away from that to meet up with one man on a desert road. If I'd been Philip, I might have been a bit upset. I would have been saying to God, things are going really well here. Surely I should stay and carry on this great work. But no, the word was he had to leave that and seek out this one man. And you, and you know what happened. The spirit said, go to the desert road. And Philip went, even though it seemed strange and unlikely pace to gossip the gospel. The spirit said, go to that particular chariot. And there was likely other traffic moving on the road, but it was just that one that Philip was directed to. The spirit told him to stay near it and from that came the opportunity to tell the occupant about Jesus. The occupant, this Ethiopian eunuch, was already a seeker. He'd been up to Jerusalem to worship and he was, actually, as many of us do today, struggling to understand the prophet Isaiah. <laughs> this man's heart was fertile ground to plant the seed of the gospel. He was ready to hear about Jesus. You see, the right place, at the right time, the right person. This is what the Spirit does. Directs us to the right people 
at the right time in the right place. Some people call this sort of serendipity. Well, I'm, I'm not keen on that. It carries with it a sort of it's all down to fate vibe. Um, I think of these as God moments. He's brought you to this person at this time in this place. It may have seemed a lot of trouble to see one man become a follower of Jesus. Uh, and if I was Philip, I think, well, I could have been back there speaking to dozens, if not hundreds, where, where back in the city where I was. But, you know, it's widely thought that um, this unit went home and evangelized Ethiopia. He became a super spreader, if you like. The virus spread in God's economy. This was a very purposeful and strategic meeting. And we often want to have large numbers at our meetings. Oh, it's just the turnout. We, we want big turnout. But just reflect on this. A Sunday school teacher in the 1920s had a young boy in his small group who grew up to be Billy Graham. That teacher would not have realized that he was laying good spiritual foundations in someone who would be used by God to reach millions. Never doubt what God is doing or despise small numbers. It's amazing what God can do. The Spirit directs us where to go and who to speak to. Now, Paul was off on one of his great missionary journeys and we read this, this is Acts 16. Their plan was to turn west into Asia province, but the Holy Spirit blocked that route. So they went to Mysia and tried to go north to Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus wouldn't let them go there either. Proceeding on through Mysia, they went down to the seaport, Troas. That night, Paul had a dream. A Macedonian stood on the far shore and called across the sea, come over to Macedonia and help us. The dream gave Paul his map. The spirit told him where to go. But we know that the spirit has an even bigger part to play than just geographical location. He also directs us in what to do or say when we get there. And Jesus himself made this clear when preparing the disciples for their task. This is uh, Luke 12. When they drag you into their meeting places or into police courts and before judges, don't worry about defending yourselves, what you'll say or how you'll say it. The right words will be there. The Holy Spirit will give you the right words when the time comes. Oh, I like that. The Holy Spirit will give you the right words when the time comes. Philip got up into the chariot and was able to start with the very words from Isaiah that the eunuch was already reading. And the eunuch gave him the opportunity. Do, do you understand this? As we find ourselves in the right place at the right time with opportunity to say something, we need to let the spirit guide what we say. When I was at college, we had the navigators come into the Christian Union to help us learn how to share the gospel. And they taught us the four spiritual laws to explain the good news. And then as part of the course, they took us to nearby Heathrow Airport to accost weary travelers with, have you heard of the four spiritual laws? I have a lot of time for navigators. They do a great work and uh, they teach you to learn the scriptures, which is brilliant. But that was a horrible experience. It's no good having a pre-prepared presentation of the four spiritual laws of the gospel in a nutshell. Whatever it is, there will be a right thing to say and the spirit will guide us to that. The right words when the time comes. And hopefully the spirit will also guide us to shut up when that's right. Do you know, it's not a failure if you don't get the whole message out in one conversation. We have to try and get through all four spiritual laws, no, no doubt. But people are on a spiritual journey and what they need is help with the next step 
not to be dragged kicking and screaming to the destination. The Spirit guides us to the right place to meet the right people and say the right things. Now let's put that into context for 2020. Well, firstly, not many of us are likely to be like Paul and told to go to Macedonia or Moldova or Mercia or Manchester or anywhere like that. Oh, it's not likely that we'll be told like Philip. Go to the country road between Lee Cross and Pontusbury. Stop the man on the bicycle. Convert him and baptise him in the Pontusbury Brook. I don't think God works like that quite in these days. For the vast majority of us, it's about being guided by the Spirit where we are as we live in this community and go about our business. So it's about the Spirit prompting us, perhaps, to be in contact with somebody. These days, we, because of lockdown, we, we pick up the phone, but in other times we might pop in to see them. Or it might be the person that we stand next to in the queue waiting to go into a shop. Maybe the Spirit suddenly brings someone to mind who you should immediately let's begin to pray for. Maybe in the middle of a conversation, the, the Spirit makes you aware of an appropriate opportunity to share your faith or speak of Jesus. Maybe as simple as when someone's been sharing a problem, the difficulties that they've been going through, just saying to them, I remember you in my prayers. This nudging of the Spirit, this is the guiding of the Spirit in our every day. And remember, the Spirit will guide us too as to what to say. And we might find this uh, a bit scary. We feel that we said the wrong thing or we didn't explain it very well. And that's OK. That's OK. Did you, did you, have you read 1 Corinthians? I think 1 Corinthians 2. Paul writing to the Corinthians, the great Paul, the great preacher, the great man of letters. And he writes to them and he says, uh, that when he came to them, he spoke feeling totally inadequate and scared to death. But he goes on to say it wasn't about the cleverness of his words, but that the words came with the Spirit's power. And when the words we speak are directed by the Spirit, they come with power and authority to achieve the Spirit's purposes. All these things might seem little and insignificant, but if the Spirit is prompting them, they're important for the building of the kingdom. Remember, the kingdom is growing quietly, imperceptibly. The building is going up one brick at a time. The building is huge, and we're adding a brick here and a brick there, and millions of Christians across the world are adding a brick here and a brick there, and the kingdom is growing. So it's important that we respond to the guiding of the Spirit. Pick up the phone if that person's come to mind and the Spirit's nudging you to contact them. Offer up that prayer for the person who's been laid suddenly on your heart. Sensitively speak about Jesus in that conversation. If we do this in our own strength, people will start to cross the street to avoid us. Because we become that person at whatever we're talking about, whether it's uh, the football, uh, washing, travel, the government. They know that we're going to tell them about Jesus <laughs> and they avoid us. But guided by the spirit, we speak the right words at the right time. And that person isn't put off, but takes another step on their journey towards faith. We may not see anything significant happen as a result, but we trust that the Spirit will take and use what we were prompted to do or say to further the growth of the kingdom. Crucial to this is being able to recognize the voice of the Spirit. We live in the noisiest times in history. We have we, we are constantly bombarded by advertising billboards where voices from the TV and the radio, a constant cacophony of voices on our smartphones. 
music available everywhere I go. I went to speak to a lady on the lot in the allotment yesterday and I was stood there for a while and she's bent over her work and I kept saying hello and she'd got these earphones in and she was singing along to the music and she couldn't hear me. That's the way the world is. And amongst the noise of the world, we need to hear the Spirit's voice. And then there's the problem of mistaking our own desires as to what God's telling us, you know, what we would like to hear God saying. <laughs> God's told me to buy a Ferrari or perhaps carrying a new set of golf clubs. Um, uh, you know, very unlikely, my friend, very unlikely. Sometimes our brain plays tricks with us. It comes from our own imaginations. You know, I had a dream that I was in uh, a 10 Downing Street with Boris and the cabinet and the ministers and I was preaching the gospel and they were all on their knees. Most likely too much cheese before bedtime. Um, not, not going to happen. But discerning the spirit's voice in all of that is important. Recently, I dabbled with speech recognition on the computer. Instead of typing a document, you dictate it and the computer translates your spoken word into the written word. I'm sorry, you techies, that wasn't a very good explanation. But to help you set this up, you're prompted to speak a, a number of given paragraphs. And the computer uses that to establish your particular accent and pronunciations. And basically, that's what we all do all the time anyway. The more we spend time with someone and listen to them, the easier it is to recognize their voice. When they ring us up, we'll know almost immediately who it is speaking. Although I have to say, this week I rang someone and uh, they answered and I said, how are you doing? And they said, hi, Brian. Now, I don't know if they mistook my voice or they don't know what my name is. I haven't figured that out yet. But the voice is a key way of recognizing someone you know. If I took six friends of yours and showed you pictures of their knobbly knees, I, I suspect you're unlikely to identify them. But if I play you a recording of their voice, you'll know who it is straight away. We need to spend time with the Lord so that we become familiar with his voice. And then we need to be attentive through the day, listening out for that voice, listening for him to prompt us wherever we are, when to speak, what to say, what to do, and when to stop speaking. Allowing him to direct us to the right place, the right time, to say or do the right thing. In this way, the kingdom of God grows. And some of you may be saying, well, yeah, hey, don't worry about you're talking about evangelism, aren't you? And I'm not an evangelist. My gifts are practical, you say. I fix and I mend. I'm an administrator. My gift's hospitality. I bake things. And I get that. And I am sure that the Spirit will guide you to use those specific gifts in special ways. But like all the rest of us, you're also a person who mixes with and talks to other people. And therefore, like every one of us, you will be nudged by the Spirit to use opportunities which come your way to help build the kingdom. With a word here, a kindly act there. If he presents an opportunity, he will help you to take it. So I believe the challenge for us here today is are we willing to be attentive to the spirit all the time so that we're aware of those moments when we're being prompted to do or say something? And then are we willing to act on it? It may seem scary. But you know, that's what faith is all about. And being obedient to the nudges of the spirit is all part of joining the great adventure of building God's kingdom. So what about you? Are you willing to offer yourself to God every day to be guided by the Spirit? Let's see that R number for the spread of the good news virus go through the roof. Amen.
Where there is hatred, let me bring your love. Where there is injury, your pardon, Lord. And where there's doubt, true faith in you. Make me a channel of your peace. Where there's despair. Hi, my name is Sarah and I wanted to share some of my story with you. Uh, we'd been going to a church for a little while and I had made a real decision that I was really going to pursue God and the things of God and of his kingdom um, more than I had in years. And so one of the things that I would do on a Saturday evening um, when I went to bed a Saturday night, I would pray and just just ask if God wanted to give me a dream or give me anything that I um, should share at church the following day. Um, so this particular night, I had a dream. Uh, some of you may have heard of a children's programme called Harry and his Bucket Full of Dinosaurs. Well, it was very much like Harry and his Bucket Full of Dinosaurs. It was a dream and I saw... Um, a board book, a, a really hard children's board book. And there was Harry. And then on the other page, there was a sandpit. And in the sandpit, there was a bucket. But it wasn't full of dinosaurs. It was full of wellies, all sorts of bright, lovely wellies. And um, I was pretty sure that this was a God dream. And so I went to church and there came a point and my heart was hammering. And I knew I had to go up and share this dream. So I went and I shared the dream and it was a bit of a flop, to be honest with you. Nothing happened. Silence. Uh, I felt like I was a bit odd, to be honest, that I'd shared this dream. Uh, so I sat down. That was the end of that. Was the end of that. Uh, there was a visitor that morning. A, a young lady had been there and she kept catching my eye, but I wasn't ever able to get away with from the person that I was speaking to, to be able to go and introduce myself and say, hi, welcome to church, etc. Uh, so that was that. The, the day ended. The following day when I went into work at that very same church, uh, the vicar came to me and said, you'll never guess what. Did you spot that young lady? And the incredible story um, 
came from her and she was so courageous, much more courageous than I was to share on the following Sunday that um, she had a young daughter and um, her daughter was ill. She had spoken to the doctors um, and she knows now that she should have followed her mother's instinct. Unfortunately, her daughter died. She, The mother had gone out and uh, she she really needed some wellies for something so she'd gone out and bought some wellies and she is so guilty that she had gone and bought wellies and so this story that I shared this dream that I shared was actually God speaking into her life saying I know you I know your situation and she was able to share that a tiny bit of her was able to forgive herself and move on and know that actually it wasn't her fault and um, so I just played a tiny part in obedience to God. And that is all that all of us can do. But it's exciting. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Sarah, um, for that lovely testimony. Um, I think that's something for us all to remember, isn't it? That we are just playing a part in God's huge and enormous plan for folks' lives. And all we need to do is trust him and be obedient. Now let's turn to intercession. And between each section of prayer, there's going to be a short silence and then I will say, and please join in with me, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Faithful God, we pray for all people who seek to follow your way in their lives. Let your church speak your word of truth with confidence and in unity so that those who are searching and listening will be able to see and hear clearly your message of love and peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Creator God, we pray for people and nations whose troubles, brought about by the global pandemic, drown out your music of harmony, and where the violent heat of anger seek to destroy your words of peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father God, we pray for the people around us, in our neighbourhood, in our places of work. Give us sensitivity and insight into their needs and vulnerabilities so that we may truly learn to love our neighbours as ourselves. Help us to be responsible and sensible in all our interactions with those around us, so that we do not increase the chance of infected, of infecting or being infected by those we meet. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, we pray for people we know who are ill, anxious or bereaved, and for those that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens. We pray that you will lead them and us in peace towards healing and wholeness of mind and spirit. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, we offer ourselves to you in faith and confidence. Show us as we go out into the world how we can best prepare ourselves to be part of your response to our prayers. Fill us with the Holy Spirit of life, which was in Christ Jesus, your Son, our Saviour. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen.
And let's say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And now we'll join in our final song together for the blessing. Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. He makes me lie in pastures green. He leads me by the still, still waters. His goodness restores my soul. And I will trust in you alone. I will trust in you alone For your endless mercy follows me Your goodness will lead me home He guides my ways in righteousness
Before I say the final blessing, I would like to thank you for joining with us this morning and to remind you of our monthly prayer meeting one, which is uh, tonight at seven o'clock, and to say thank you to Stu and Sue and John and Sarah for their contributions. And now a blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve our Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.